From the Oregon State University Extension Service, this is Pollination, a podcast that tells the stories of researchers, land managers, and concerned citizens making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. I'm your host, Dr. Adoni Melithopoulos, Assistant Professor in Pollinator Health in the Department of Horticulture. There are many schemes to improve pollinator habitat for bees. I think back to an episode that we had with Mace Vaughn from the Xerces Society, who pointed out that there are numerous federal programs uh, that come together under the Farm Bill legislation that are dedicated to improving pollinator habitat on working lands. Today's guest puts a twist on this question. What bees are we actually trying to create habitat for? Cheyenne Lindsay is a master's student at the University of Nebraska in the Department of Entomology. I ran into her at the Pacific Northwest Mixer at the Entomological Society of America meeting in Vancouver, British Columbia that took place in November. And in our conversations, I learned about her fascinating research of really trying to think more carefully about how to tailor our uh, our habitat to suit specific bees. And I'm in a real key consideration is ensuring that maybe in some cases, habitat should primarily be created for honeybees. And that may have benefits, indirect benefits uh, to wild and native bees. So without further ado, let's head to the uh, convention center in downtown Vancouver, British Columbia uh, for a conversation with Cheyenne Lindsay this week on pollination. Well, welcome to Pollination, Cheyenne. We're here in beautiful British Columbia overlooking the water. Yes. <laughs> and we're both far from home. Yes. Yes, we are, <laughs> for sure. You're from, you're from Nebraska. Yes, I am a current master's student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, I am in the bee lab, and I study wild bees and honeybees and what flowers they like to go to. <laughs> and I am, I, I, we've talked about this before on the show that, you know, there's all sorts of... Uh, concern about loss of pollinator habitat yes. and you know habitat for both managed and native bees. Can you tell us a little bit about the situation in Nebraska? Yeah, so we are, like I said, in the um, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which is located within this tall grass prairie ecosystem. And historically, the state of Nebraska, it was a very widely diverse prairie system ranging from tall grass to short grass. And we also have the Sand Hills region. But if you look at what the actual ecotypes are of the state and what the land use utilization is for these areas, uh, we've had a 92% uh, change from native prairie habitat to farming ecosystems and working lands, um, whether it's for rangelands for cattle or row crop agriculture. Mm -hmm. So this massive land use change has raised a lot of questions for um, ecosystems for all um, all groups, but I am specifically interested in the pollinators and how they have responded to so, this issue. Okay, that's great. So there, there was, a, and we had a we had a, a, um, a person from uh, World Wildlife Fund that had a bit mm-hmm. uh, northern uh, Great Plains mm-hmm. uh, project, and just you know, just you know, for most of us to think of grasslands, we think of like grass, but there's mm-hmm. all sorts of forbs yes. growing in there, and so there was some extent, you know arthropod community with mm-hmm. bees were uh, bees and butterflies were a part of mm-hmm. uh, and so this has been transformed now it's like it, you know it's in these little remnants and what you have is you know a soy corn landscape yep and that must raise the question of is there something you can do to mitigate and there, I, we've had mace vaughn on a previous episode talking about uh, uh, you know a, a host of farm bill pro uh, based programs through nrcs but there's mm-hmm. also private initiatives um, mm-hmm. So, okay, so this is the context of your research. This is the world we live in. We live in this intensive yes. ag, trying to do restoration. So what, what, was the, what was the specific problem that you sort of uh, are structuring your master's thesis around? Yeah, so um, like I said, we've had this massive land use change. We're studying specifically the state of Nebraska, but this is definitely a widespread issue across the Great Plains and even across the U.S. And what we're left with is with this land use conversion is these little remnant spots Um, that are the leftover prairie or areas that have been converted back to some sort of wildflower habitat. 
uh, whether it be specifically for pollinators or for other uses. So um, there are the seed mix programs such as the NRCS and the CRP, and these aren't necessarily intended for pollinators. They have po pollinator value, but what landowners are using them for is pheasant habitat and fire breaks between their properties. And um, so they pu they're putting these native forbs and bunch grasses into them to restore the pollinator habitat back to, or uh, make the best of it that we can, I guess. And what I wanna know is how we can further improve these scraps that we have left and how we can make them, basically maximizing the land use that we currently have. Um, there's no way we're gonna completely restore all of the Midwest back to native prairie. Um, we, we're not gonna stop big ag, that's not something that's gonna happen. But what we can do is make the best of these small parcels and um, so what I am doing is I'm trying to address the question of how can we further improve these lands for pollinators by addressing um, all of the native bees that we do have here. The United States is home to 4,000 species. In Nebraska, we have about four to 500, and they are all the specialties. There are ground nesters and soil um, stem nesters, and there's parasitic bees. There are social, solitary, and everything in between and most of them also have very specific habitat and foraging needs. And these might not necessarily be met by these general usage uh, habitats. So by looking at the- Like a cover crop. Yeah. You put a bunch of yeah. clover in. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And that it's, yeah, sure, it's food. Just because you put flowers there, is it actually doing what you're intending it to? The intention might be there, but we want to know if it's actually working, if we're actually doing the right thing to save the bees, in, in quotes. In addition, here in the Midwest, this is a high um, usage area for honeybees. And a lot of these farmers are additionally putting these habitats in as forage for their honeybees to also yield, um, increase uh, pollination services on their crops. So we have these really small habitats within agricultural systems with honeybees and we're kind of just expecting it to be okay. So how can we further um, improve these habitats but also mitigate competition, which is a massive um, issue that a bunch of people are trying to get at is, uh, we don't fully understand it, but um, I, I wanna know how we can possibly use okay. the landscape design. So the concern is that you have, you, you build this pretty pricey pollinator habitat, mm -hmm. and then there's a bunch of honeybee colonies there, and then, you know, a good chunk of the nectar and pollen being produced there is sort of goes into the honeybee colony where mm -hmm. um, you know there may not be sufficient resources you know to support some of the uh, the wild unmanaged species okay right. so tell us how you've tried to address this problem yeah so what we are specifically looking at is the um, the pollinator preference so what the both the managed bees and the wild bees are using how frequently um, what times of the year. So we've been sampling during the early, mid, and late season, um, which are different peaks in the summer when we expect the, um, the blooms to be at their peak because there's, there's constant change between what flowers are in, in bloom. So if we go in the early, mid, and late summer, um, this also will give us different uh, species compositions of the bees as well. And what we're doing is we're collecting the bees specifically off of the flowers we find them foraging on and uh, collecting that data, bringing them back, identifying the bees to species. And um, what we've found so far is there, uh, a lot of these seed mixes have a very high composition of things like alfalfa and vetch, um, sweet clovers, other types of ground clovers. They're, they're uh, very high in legumes. Mm -hmm. And um, what we've found though is that when there are other native species present within these mixes, the wild bees would rather utilize those than the things that are of higher abundance. So um, for example, some things like uh, cup plant and compass plant are very um, uncommon in these seed mixes, but they are highly sought after by the pollinators, and that's where we find the most bees yeah. are on flowers like that. Um, versus honeybees would rather use the alfalfas and vetches and clovers. So when we have these, um, these preferred plants by the honeybees and these preferred plants by the wild bees within the system, and there is enough resources still for these native pollinators, there's not as much foraging overlap occurring. And so there's um, some seed mix programs that are used like utilizing this habitat design of placing uh, honeybee preferred forage next to 
the wild bee preferred forage. And if we can continuously manage the landscape and be land stewards to this area, um, we can basically resource partition who is using what and uh, also reducing this crossover. And this is, oh, um, yeah, this is beneficial not only because you're allowing everybody to get the food that they need, but honeybees also transmit many pathogens. And we don't fully understand how um, the, the pathogens get from honeybee to wild bee, but we do know that it happens. But the idea is if we separate who is using what, we can possibly um, keep our bees healthier too, so that they're, they're not getting sick and transmitting things from one to the other. Uh, let me well. get this right. This is a little bit complicated, but so you, if you had, like you, you notice these preferences, mm -hmm. and so one of the implications might be that if you planted a block of sweet clover, mm -hmm. best plant for bees, mm -hmm. honeybees, on the planet, <laughs> <laughs> they, do, they do love it. <laughs> you, you plant a big block of this, mm -hmm. that the honeybees may not like go and visit flowers that have, might be of a little less preference to them, mm -hmm. and we're, that that allows the nectar and pollen to build up on those flowers, mm -hmm. so that the wild bees. So you're paradoxically, it's kind of strange. It's like to help native bees, I'm planting exotic legumes. Yes, so huh. this raises a lot of questions and concerns for this area, but these plants are already highly abundant within this landscape because they love these stress systems mm -hmm. that are present within um, agricultural lands. So this also comes down to the management question of, we can't really get rid of them. We have to make the best of what we have, but we can take care of it in a way that makes it less of an issue and you basically got to pick your poison. Would you rather have the bees constantly competing and continuing species declines due to lack of resources, or would we rather just bite the bullet, have, allow these um, maybe not necessarily exotic uh, or not necessarily invasive species, but not native species either, um, just exist and mm -hmm. be the forage for the also non-native honeybee um, to allow everybody to get what they need. Well, and I suppose this also, you know, um, raises the issue of the uh, differential price that, you know, a lot of these legume seeds are cheap. And so yes. a landowner can come in who may not, uh, may have a mild, uh, a, you know, commitment to bees, mm -hmm. really isn't interested in mm -hmm. pheasants. And this would be a great for her or him to plant. Mm -hmm. And then you may have somebody who's just really dedicated and wants to do high tier you know, stewardship and, mm -hmm. you know, they may plant something else and it, eventually over this patchwork of degraded land, you you know, the honeybees will find these nice, or the beekeepers probably will find these nice plots of mm -hmm. um, more um, cheaper to plant uh, mixes and then um, na native bee populations will colonize and sort of build up in these areas where yes. these other... So that is another component to my research, actually. Uh, I don't think we had discussed that previously, but with this preference analysis that I'm doing of the uh, what the bees are using and how frequently and how often, I am additionally looking at what the cost per a certain amount of seed is for these. And I'm trying to see if we can possibly alter the ratios of some of these um, these forbs mm -hmm. that so that way we are maybe cutting down the amount that we're spending on these less preferred plants that are already highly abundant because they're cheap they're fillers mm -hmm. um, in exchange for just increasing the pollinator value just a little bit by um, putting these more preferred oh, plants right. in. Because you now, because you've got this big data set, you've mm -hmm. gone through meticulously seen which bee goes to which flower, mm -hmm. you now can go back to those mixes and say, well, even for wild bees, mm -hmm. I can get the maximum number of genera mm -hmm. with these three plants. Mm -hmm. And these ones here are super spendy mm -hmm. and rarely see that many bees on it. So maybe we can punt that one out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're, uh, we're going through and meticulously selecting which are the highest benefit plants and how we can increase their, their abundance without um, increasing the cost too much. Because, yeah, like you said, the accessibility to these seed mixes um, per acre can be a little outrageous and people don't necessarily want to, um, to spend that if they're not, if, a lot of people don't even know or really care about the wild bees. Like you said, these uh, private landowners, a lot of them are looking for that pheasant habitat. So um, if we can just increase the value of those and maximize what we have there, get the most bang for your buck um, type scenario, um, that would be even just a huge benefit to the landscape. 
So uh, where are you in your research? What, uh, what stage are you at? I am almost done. Um, so I've collected all of my data. I am in the process of analyzing it. I'm running my statistics, and I'm in the process of writing. Um, this upcoming spring, I will be working on getting my publications out and looking to graduate either this spring or this summer. Fantastic so. uh, project. I'm really glad to hear about it. I'm sure our, our uh, listeners up in the Pacific Northwest are excited because I'm, I'm sure this has, uh, although it's a very Nebraska-focused project, the, the principle mm -hmm. may have application across the continent. Yes. Yeah, and the, the species that I'm studying are going to be more specific to my area, but the overall idea, I was just talking to some other students this morning that how great would it be if a project like this was done on a national scale because the flowers on the bee composition is going to vary depending on the region, but this overall idea is still um, uh, applicable to the entire country. So. Well, fantastic. Thanks yes. for taking a little break in a very busy Entomological <laughs> Society of America session. Yes, of course. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. The show is produced by Quinn Sin and Neil, who's a student here at OSU in the New Media Communications Program. And the show wouldn't even be possible without the support of the Oregon Legislature, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, and Western SARE. Show notes with links mentioned on each episode are available on the website, which is at pollinationpodcast.oregonstate.edu. I also love hearing from you, and there's several ways to connect with me. The first one is you can visit the website and leave an episode-specific comment. You can suggest a future guest or topic or ask a question that could be featured in a future episode. But you can do the same things on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by visiting the Oregon Bee Project. Thanks so much for listening, and see you next week.